Welcome to The Insider, the official podcast for the City of Murfreesboro. I'm Mike Browning. Our guests for this podcast are Community Development Director Robert Holtz and Assistant Director Jessica Klein. Robert and Jessica, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us today. We appreciate it. So we're going to be talking about everything community development. And for many people who are listening or watching on YouTube, they don't really know what that is. What is community development? Uh, well, it's a small department. We have three people in it, but uh, we do big things in the city. Uh, community development is a department within the city of Murfreesboro. We actually fall under development services with planning, building and codes, and GIS. And you used to be the director of building and codes. I was, yes, years for ago. For a n- number of years. Yes, yes. Um, our mission in community development is to assist low and mod income families, and we refer to them as LMI families with various housing needs that they may have. Uh, And one thing unique about our department is that most of our funding comes from federal and state grants. We also get some from the city, Uh, but we use that money to help low-mod families with with their housing needs. Uh, One thing uh, that we cannot do is we cannot distribute funds directly to the public. We're not allowed to do that. But how we do distribute the funds is a couple of ways. One is through what we call public service grants. So we'll give grants to local nonprofits who will distribute it out to the people who are in need. And that's a much more efficient way. Uh, And Murfreesboro's truly blessed with some really good nonprofits. They are dedicated, they're passionate about what they do. And in addition to that, they're required to match what we give them. So if we give a Nonprofit twenty five thousand dollars. They're required to spend twenty five thousand of their own money when they spend our money. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, it, community development obviously has to develop some pretty good partnerships or relationships with these agencies to mm-hmm. do what you do. We do. We do. We do. We work closely with them, um, and they're good to work with. And there's a whole lot of reporting. Uh, that goes into these. We have to submit all these reports to the city finance department to HUD. Uh, so it gets pretty detailed uh, how we handle uh, our, our partners. Obviously, you can't do what you do without money, funding, right. uh, from some source. And uh, Jessica, if you could explain to us uh, as your role, Assistant Director, um, you know, I know you've been involved in grant uh, funding uh, for some time, even before you came to the city of Murfreesboro. So where, where do you get the funding from? Yeah, so um, we get... Um, our funding and the source of three different grants to come directly from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, um, and that is the Community Development Block Grant, um, and that focuses on um, safe and sanitary housing. Um, we also provide suitable living environments um, and economic opportunities to the low moderate income community within the city. Um, the other one is our home partnership investment program that's another grant from HUD and that one focuses on affordable housing only Um, whether it's the development of um, rehabilitating affordable housing purchasing affordable housing and we we do that in partnership with other nonprofits Um, currently we're working with the Murfreesboro Housing Authority um, Habitat for Humanity and Doors of Hope on several different projects under that grant. You mentioned the Murfreesboro Housing Authority. I noticed uh, not long ago that the city gave a grant. Yes. So you gave a grant to the Housing Authority to help with their development. Yes. Yes, we're helping um, partially fund the redevelopment of um, Mercury. Which is the new one that they're doing now, Mercury Court, I think it's called? Yes. Yes. So one of the things that people may ask is, like, affordable housing is a big issue now. The lack of affordability is fairly widespread because of inflation and just the cost of housing. Um, So, and and you can only do so much. It would seem like the need is greater than your ability to be able to provide help. It is, unfortunately. Um, So we we do what we can to help encourage homeownership um, and and. One of the ways we do that is partnering with Habitat. Um, we assist them with a down payment program and um, trying to get trying to get families into homes and have a little bit of their own property here and, and their own ownership in the city. Because that's one of the first issues, I think, Robert, that people would face is how do you get into the home and you have to have some kind of down payment 
to get in to begin with, and yeah. that's usually a pretty substantial cost. It is. It is. Uh, and we actually have a down payment program uh, where we can give up to uh, $14,999. We're hoping to raise that in the future um, that we can give to someone for a first-time home buyer if they qualify as a low-mod income family. Let's discuss that in a little more detail. I know uh, there's this idea of a median income, and you have to base what you can provide to the people as kind of a a requirement or restriction based on median income. So let's say let's say there's a family that comes to you and uh, they are under that threshold. What would they qualify for? Um, with the down payment assistance, they would they qualify for up to the fourteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Um, towards the purchase of their home, they go out and secure their mortgage, or if they're coming from Habitat, they've done all of that with Habitat. Um, and we kind of come in on, on the end there to help them bring down that cost of purchasing the home to try to, to bring it within an affordable range, which would mean that their mortgage payment would be no more than 30% of their income. It would seem to me, Robert, that there are a lot of people who could qualify, um, but maybe some people don't even attempt to qualify. They don't come to you. Is there a stigma attached to, to this kind of thing? I no, not that I know of. I think it's more of people don't know it's available. Um, that's what we're here for. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly why we're here. Um, it, it's a great program. We, we wish we could do more. We want to do more in the future. Um, but right now, I mean, if someone's looking to needs a, some down payment assistance, reach out to us. We'll, we'll walk you through the process. And your site is on the website. It's murfreesboro.tn.com. Gov, right. and then under government, it's in community development, Correct. so it's pretty easy to yes. find. Yes, and then do you have a number that people could call? Um, it's 615, I don't call it a lot, 890 yeah. 4660. 890-4660. Yes, okay. yes. And then there's this other aspect that you do. Uh, you actually get involved in preventing deterioration of, of homes. Like when homes become dilapidated because of a lack of funds, yeah. then you, you assist with that. We do. We do. That's our housing rehab program. So if you're a homeowner, lived in your home for over, over a year, uh, and you income qualify, we can, you can come to the office. We'll talk to you. We'll eventually come out to your house and see what repairs need to be made. And then we'll go through the city purchasing process to hire a contractor to come out and repair your house. So we have put new roofs on houses. Uh, we started putting a roof on one person's house and found out the roof structure was deteriorating, so we had to brace it up. Uh, we replaced someone whose kitchen floor has fallen in from leaks. So we do a lot of rehab work. And so there's some things you do do, like roofing and doors and windows, but other things that you don't do. Yeah, there, there's some things HUD won't allow us to do, such as if you want to paint your house a different color, new carpet colors, stuff like that, we can't do. So generally speaking, it's uh, we get, need to make sure your home meets property maintenance standards is what we're mm -hmm. looking for. Jessica, community development block grants. Uh, many people have heard of that because that program's been around since 1974. Correct. A, a federal government program. Explain the, that basically for us. What what is that, and how does the city benefit? Yeah. Um, so it's a it is a formula grant. Um, you have to meet certain requirements, which has to do with your um, your housing stock, poverty level. Um, we have to have a minimum population of fifty thousand in the city um, to qualify for that. Um, we are an entitlement community, so we are um, we are awarded annually. Um, without a formal application, um, which also allows us to receive money from the Tennessee Housing Development Agency um, as a set-aside grant for um, homeless prevention, rapid rehousing, um, shelter, helping support shelters. Um, because of being an entitlement community, we are awarded that as a set-aside as well. So there's a lot of benefits to the community um, by being eligible for that program. Let me ask a follow-up question to that to understand a little more. So the federal government provides money for these com community development block grants. Do they just provide a, a certain amount of funding, let's say a million dollars, and then it's up to the city to decide how that's distributed based on need and based on qualifications? Yes. So they award us a set amount. This this year's was a little over um, 930000 
Um, and we create an annual action plan every year that goes through two public comment periods. Um, and that, that kind of outlines what activities we want to do with that money, what we see our need is, um, which is typically um, housing rehab, um, down payment assistance is included in there, our public service grants. And then we always put a little bit aside for um, public infrastructure or public facilities, depending on what the need is. We ask the public's input on that if there's a need we don't see, um, so we can better reach the community. So, uh, Robert, when, when you have these public hearings, then the, the, the agencies probably normally come to you and say, hey, here's, here's a need that we recognize, we try to help in this area, and then they suggest maybe a way that they could help if they had the funding. There's a process to that. Yeah, right? yeah that, that is part of it. Um, I can tell you that our partners and the nonprofits know more about the homeless community, the LMI community, than we do. Now, we do get to meet a lot of them, um, but they are much more knowledgeable. So we kind of rely on them to help give us input on how to, what, what, do we, what activities is what we're talking about, what activities do we fund. Mm-hmm. HUD will allow us to fund a variety of activities. We can purchase property, uh, renovate property. Uh, we bought a daycare last year for Murfreesboro City Schools. And I say we bought it. We contributed some money towards it. Mm-hmm. Then we renovated it last summer, and it was open for school year last year. And they are required to maintain a uh, an enrollment of at least 51% of the kids come from LMI families. So mm-hmm. it, And that's on the west side of town where city schools do not have a daycare over there. So then so, there are ways that seem a little bit innovative or new that can qualify for this program mm-hmm. it's there are limits obviously but still there there is a lot of options out there the the biggest restraint we have is the amount of money i mean obviously everybody has that problem you know but uh, that's our biggest limiting factor jessica one thing that uh community development does that people may not recognize as something you do is tree removal so yes. why do you even get involved in tree removal and um, we do that to help preserve their their property and their home reduce the risk of potential damage um so if if you're a homeowner and and meet the same requirements as our rehab program um we'll have the city arborist go out and take a look at the tree of concern and if it's dead diseased dying or poses an immediate threat um then it can qualify for removal and and we pay for the cost of that removal so that it doesn't in a windstorm fall on their house or cause damage that could prevent them from living in their home. And that's a fairly costly thing, having a, an entire tree, especially a large tree removed. Yeah, yeah. we just paid uh, to have one lady's tree removed. It was an ash tree, uh, and it was about $4,000 to have it removed. And that's one of those trees, I think, that has become diseased in yes, our area. Yes, uh, emerald. Emerald ash. Yes, thank you. Ash borer or whatever. <laughs> yeah, ash borer something, something like that. Like that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, owner-occupied rehabilitation program. Robert, yeah. what is that? Well, that, that's what we talked about a little earlier. That's, uh, that's a program that I'm involved in deeply. Um, and so we have homeowners coming to us all the time about housing needs they have. We replaced five HVAC units this year. Uh, they had no cooling at all, and they had no way of getting them. And it's, it's close to $10,000 to replace an HVAC unit. So we did that. Uh, so our rehab program is is in my opinion, one of our better programs. And that's the one that includes things like flooring mm-hmm. and windows and doors that can make the home more efficient Yes, uh, to help them with their utility bills, yes. for example, yeah. if they have this qualification for the replacement yes, or that, rehab. That's correct. Are there obviously limited funds for that? So uh, approximately how much can you devote to rehabilitation on an annual basis? Uh, well, we, I mean, uh, we could devote all of it to it, but that would leave our partners in the nonprofit community without money or some money. So we tried to distribute it through our annual action plan to cover the major things that we think need to be dealt with. So that's where the action plan comes in. Then you have to prioritize like the percentages that can go to each Yeah, we'll each actually program. put the dollar amounts in there. For, for example, and our annual action plan is on our website. But for this year, we put 
uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars towards owner occupied rehab projects. There's a, a, I think something coming up in September. Is that the action plan? No, that or is that something else? That's the caper. That the caper, right? Consolidated annual performance and evaluation report, which is to kind of make you accountable for what you do. In, yes, in yes. So we have our annual action plan, which tells the public what we're going to do. The caper tells them what we did. So okay. those two documents, the beginning and end, are tied together. Uh, Will this be a public comment period again for the CAPER, or how does that work? We do have a public meeting, and we there disclose what we've done. Obviously, you can make public comment at that time and tell us maybe where we should have spent the money. But it, when we're presenting the CAPER, the, mm -hmm. the facts are there. We've already done everything. So. so, Jessica, where will that meeting be held and when? Do we know yet? Has that been established? Um, we've, we have not yet. Um, it will be in the beginning of September. The caper will go out for public review um, starting September 3rd, and the meeting should be on September 11th. The lo location and time and all of that will be up on our webpage, and it also goes out in um, newspaper and Right. And so there will the be media. a public notice on that, and yes. we'll have it on the homepage, uh, www.murfreesboro.tn.gov. Yes. Um, typically, you have it at, like, Patterson Park, but you probably had it other places before, but that's typically where you have it. Well, we've kind of changed the airport, um, mm -hmm. Patterson Park. Last time we were there, they had a basketball tournament or something, okay. and it was hard for the public to find our room, so we've moved so the it to the airport. Good central location. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and Good. we're thinking we, we're going to start having some public meetings at McFad Community Center where we're located. Are there other public services that you offer that maybe we haven't addressed, maybe in, in smaller ways? Or? Yeah, so um, we do a public service grant, which comes out of the Community Development Block Grant funding, um, and that typically awards $25,000 to um, nonprofits. They apply... Um, for the grants, it's a competitive grant. Um, we usually take applications in January. Um, for the next year, their grant cycle runs July 1st through June 30th. Um, and we do we do several different programs with that. Um, this year, we are um, working to provide additional um, hours for one of our uh, organizations that helps with homeless prevention needs um, and other services. Um, we work with the domestic violence shelter. Um, we're working with um, a program for individuals or adults that have development or intellectual disabilities. Um, we do a couple of children's programs. So we we bring in a variety of programs. We kind of look for what's got a big community impact. What's what's going to impact the most people in our community um, with what we can provide them. And let's go back to affordable housing just for a second, since that is the big topic in our area. Um, there are qualifications, and we've discussed some of those, that, that HUD requires. Uh, let's discuss that so that if someone's listening, they kind of know what they're in for if they apply for some affordable housing assistance. Yeah, um, so there, there's, there's a couple of avenues. One is there, there's probably a half a dozen complexes, apartment complexes in town that offer affordable housing. In other words, you go to the property manager, fill out an application, you show them your income, whatever documents you need, they'll look at it, and then they'll try to set your rent at 30% or less of your income. Uh, the other affordable housing option we have here is Murfreesboro Housing Authority. Uh, they, I'm not sure how many units they have, but they have quite a few, and they've got some really nice units now. That they just added. Yes, uh, yes. As uh, part near of their, Oakland, mm -hmm. Oakland development. So Beautiful complex. It now. is, it is. And I'm kind of jealous when I drive through there, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's nice. So, it's that nice. Uh, those are the options, um, you know, and then our down payment assistance uh, can can help people. So when you talk about the, it sounds like that apartment, certain apartments, uh, complexes, and that means the owners and the managers of these complexes are already uh, involved in or they, they participate in this HUD program. So they know how to facilitate that. Yes, they do. So they can apply for their own grants to help build the apartment complex. So they'll get that money from HUD and, and they don't go through us. They'll build the complex, and then they have to sign some agreements saying that they'll offer 
X number of units for affordable housing units. Not to put both of you on the spot, but can we name a few of those complexes that you might think of as, as some place that we could go and then they, they immediately apply for this HUD assistance? I can't think of the names off, <laughs> right okay. off the top of my head. I know there's, um, there are a couple on Warrior um, that are... On Warrior Drive? Yes. Okay. That um, do have that. They're for low income. <laughs> yeah, that's helpful. Um, there is uh, one over in the McFadden neighborhood. I mean, that one's a very, that one's a very large one. Um, they've got, I want to say roughly 100 units. It might be off a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. um, but that one is an affordable housing um, complex as okay. well. That's very helpful. Uh, I, yeah, I just recalled. So Murfreesboro Housing Authority has that list as on well their, on their website. Yes. yes. Now, one of the things I know <coughs> with them is that they have such a need that most of the people, like in Oakland's, already lived in the complex. That when they rehabilitated the neighborhood, they moved back into those. So they they really couldn't offer it to a whole lot of new people. Right. Right. But maybe Mercury Court might be might be different that's true they add more units. Um, i think they're required to relocate people at mha's cost and then uh, possibly bring them back to the new unit uh, when they're completed but, uh, finally let's let's just address caper one more time so okay. you'll be involved in that process going forward here for the rest of the year yeah and that is your process of making sure you're accountable for the past and so this process will be for like FY 23, right? Or somewhere, it, it will be somewhere in the past. Yeah. So uh, we go by program years, which okay. is the opposite of fiscal years. So mm -hmm. right now we're currently in program year 24. All right. So uh, on our website, you can actually find the caper, I think, for 22. Um, and we haven't put 23 up there. We're waiting for HUD to release Approved. it. And then mm -hmm. we're fixing to produce 24. If someone would read that report, what are the kind of things that they should look for or that you have to deal with in order to provide that report as, as an accountability measure? Uh, putting the report together is not that complicated. It, it will list the number of people that we've impacted uh, through our public service grants. Uh, we'll list how many rehab projects we did, how many trees removed. And we'll list all those things. We'll list how much money we spent for all those things. Uh, Jessica, this sounds very similar to what a person would need to do to qualify for a grant. In other words, you can't just get money, uh, even though it might be nice, just falling from the trees. You have yes. to be able to show what your impact is and whether you're actually m making a difference. Yes, that's correct. So our, um, our nonprofits that get our public service grants, when they submit, um, we reimburse them for costs. So when they submit a request to be reimbursed, they're also required to submit a report for that quarter. Um, and that includes how many people they helped, what the income is, um, where they where they fit in that income limit currently. So we can see what are the what are the individuals that have the biggest need? Are they in our lowest income bracket? Do they, are they just right at the top of that median income? Where are they falling in there? And how many people are we helping? Um, and we're looking not just at households that we're helping. We're looking at individuals. Um, some of our some of our programs, if you're helping a family get into an apartment, you're not just impacting the parents there, you're also impacting those kids that live in that house. And so we're, we're looking at how big of an impact we're making um, to each individual as well as the household size. Just as a final question, uh, this is maybe not something that you can address directly, but I'd like to ask it because, uh, you know, the federal government is uh, deeply in, in debt. We have a huge deficit. And at some point, you know, government leaders will probably be forced to find a way to to cut uh, the budget. And that could involve community development block grants and other things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the average person may think, well, you know, the government's got to do that. But they don't always know what the impact might be in the communities that we live. Yeah. So give us some kind of an idea of if, if, if this kind of funding was cut and you weren't able to help, what, what that would do. Um. Well, so from my perspective, it would be the rehab projects, and she can probably address public service grants, but the majority of rehab projects I do are for senior citizens. They're usually widows. Uh, they're living on Social Security, and they have a house that's paid for, and it's kept very well. But the shingles have worn out, 
and to put a new roof on is fifteen twenty thousand dollars they don't have that they don't have that and so if you don't get a new roof on it your house is not going to be habitable over a period mm-hmm. of time and therefore they're they're going to have to they'll become homeless so uh this this impact i think especially on the senior citizen community is, is powerful um, most of the people when we're done are, are in tears and they didn't know what they were going to do six months ago mm-hmm. and now they have an answer and, and they're looking good for the next 30 years we hope. okay well put jessica what about on, on your side of things on the public service side um one of our one of our organi- organizations within the first half of last year had helped over 80 families find housing to prevent them from becoming homeless um, so it, without that funding, we'd have we'd have a lot of families that wouldn't be able to afford rent. Um, maybe they couldn't afford a deposit to get into an apartment, um, which would increase our homeless numbers drastically. Well, thanks to both of you for what you do. And, and if, is there anything else that you wanted to address here at the end? Uh, well, a couple of things that we talked about beforehand is uh, the two one one number. Uh, oh, right. Yeah. If if. If you're in need of assistance, whether it's housing or not, you can call 211 in Murfreesboro, and someone will ask you questions, find out what your needs are, and they will take your information, and they will get you to the correct nonprofit. Instead of you having to drive around and do you pay doctor bills, do you help with food, 211 will give you the answer and tell you where you need to go. It's a centralized number that will then facilitate where where the help could be provided. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and one other thing, so we're, Jessica's kind of in the process. We got curious about how much money through the years has community development put into Murfreesboro. And so we're coming up with a number of, since about early 90s, about $24 million that we have pumped into the community. That does not count the matching funds that nonprofits have to give and the city has given. Uh, so I think it's a fairly powerful impact. I think it would be it, – it's one of those things, if it's here, you don't think about it, but when it's gone, you miss it. Right, and there would be a huge impact if I, that I, was gone. I, I really yes. think there would be. Any other thing that you wanted to mention, Jessica? Uh, I, I don't think so other than just the, the partnerships that we've created and the ability to help this community that sometimes gets a little forgotten um, – it's it's a good it's a good program and hopefully more people will take notice of the programs and opportunities that we have um, and hopefully we'll get some that want to participate in our down payment assistance or um, maybe help out with some of these nonprofits and seeing what they do. Jessica Klein, Assistant Director, and Robert Holtz, the Director of Community Development in Murfreesboro. Thanks to both of you for being our guests. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. You've been. Uh, Listening to uh, two of the folks that help run the community development department within the city of Murfreesboro. We've originated this podcast from the city of Murfreesboro. Thanks a lot for joining us on The Insider on multiple platforms. Uh, You can also watch The Insider on YouTube as well as Facebook. Our producer is Michael Nevels. For more information on the fast-growing city of Murfreesboro, it's murfreesborotn.gov. I'm Mike Browning. Thanks for joining us on The Insider.